What's working on YouTube right now? We found recently that like three hour long podcasts, kind of like the sweet spot. YouTube is very much a momentum based platform where if you post a good video, your next video is gonna give you even more views. And so you could compound on that. It's like a snowball effect. They're coming to YouTube because they want something. And usually that something is really funny entertainment. It's something that they can learn. If you're not offering anything, there's no reason for people to watch. Custom hooks strategy. What's that? Do you think video podcasting is too saturated though and that can people still start new shows this year? Welcome back to the Fake Media Podcast. Imagine if getting 73 million YouTube views in one month was a down month for you. Today, we have Graham Stephan on the show, personal finance coach and expert, running three channels, one of the biggest video podcasts, the Iced Coffee Hour. And in really the last 30 days, 73 million views were generated across his channels. But I was just talking to him and he's like, it's actually kind of a low month. And so in this episode, we're going to be talking about his secrets. Uh, Graham, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I hope I'm high energy enough. I'm a bit jet lagged right now. So like, Hopefully the energy's there. I appreciate to it. Back it from up. Japan yeah. yeah, and on the podcast, super grateful. But let's just go straight to it. Cool. What's working on YouTube right now? It seems like podcasts, uh, and then you clip them up and you post shorts. So okay. long form, over an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Like We found recently that like three hour long podcasts, kind of like the sweet spot. Mm. And then clipping those up into shorts, and we A-B test on TikTok, we A-B test on Instagram, we see what does well, and then we figure out what we post on YouTube. Yeah, define what A-B testing is and how you actually A-B test on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, so we'll post a lot of clips. So we post about two, sometimes three clips a day on TikTok or Instagram, and we'll see which ones do well. If we post a clip and we think this should have done well and it doesn't, we'll look at that clip and we'll say, well, maybe the intro, you just lost some people there. Like halfway through, there's a boring part, we could clip that out, kind of hone it in. Sometimes post it again, and if that does better, then we figure out the best performing videos of the, of those, and then we could post those on YouTube. Like we we want to be selective with YouTube. One of the people you collab with said, "Ask Graham about his custom hooks strategy." What's that? Custom hooks strategy. Oh, Josh. Hey, Josh. Yeah. So Josh will sometimes tell me to say certain things at the beginning of a clip. So if we're in a podcast setting. Sometimes it'll lead into a conversation where I don't have to ask the question. The guest might just unprompted say something. But you need a hook for TikTok or shorts. You can't just have the guest start talking about something. So for me, he'll say, Graham, I need you to go and say this word. I can't believe you did that. Or how did you get arrested? Or just some hook in the beginning that, you know, when people are scrolling, they'll want to stop and keep watching. Super smart. So after you have the full podcast recorded separately, you think about what is a lead in for that. And I think he sent me an example that was Grant Cardone talking maybe about his private jet. And you shot a clip that better teed up what Grant Cardone was about to go in. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So in that one, that one was unique because Josh was with us in the room and we were doing the podcast and he was behind the cameras taking notes. So if there's an interesting segment, he could tell me afterwards, Graham, I just want you to ask this question again. And we could place that question in the podcast to make it look like I'm asking that question. Maybe I didn't phrase it. Sometimes I stutter ums and ahs. It just doesn't sound good. So I could refilm those those certain little clips. Yeah. So post-production, you're recording a custom hook to better have that content go viral. What is, once you test on TikTok and Instagram, do you know how many po clips you're posting on Ice Coffee Hour, for example? How many episodes a week do you do long form? And how many shorts are you posting that make it to the channel? Yeah. One episode a week, every Sunday morning, 9 a.m. And if it's delayed, something went wrong. So if it posts later than nine, it's a rendering problem. Yeah. Uh, and then how many shorts we post? I would say at the most four. Usually it's two to three a week. And okay. that sometimes depends on the performance of the last clips. Like if we have one clip that's like doing really well, we'll sometimes let that ride out. And so we'll skip a posting of a clip. But usually it's three. Are you... So you are trying to go quality over quantity by the time it reaches YouTube. Yeah. You're letting the quantity be on TikTok and Instagram and only putting the best of the best on YouTube. Yeah, I've noticed that on TikTok and Instagram, the performance of the prior video doesn't matter as much as on YouTube. Like YouTube is very much a momentum-based platform where if you post a good video, your next video is gonna give you even more views. And so you could compound on that. And then if the next video gets more views, your next video is gonna get even more views. And if you tee it up correctly, 
it'll just like, it's like a snowball effect. Whereas on TikTok, you could have one video that does really well, the next one does horrible, and then the next one does really well. So it's like each video is its own thing. So it doesn't matter as much. So you could kind of blast TikTok with whatever and it doesn't really matter. So a better place to split test. And there's this, there is, it's like conspiracy theories. People are mad. There's all kinds of YouTube videos titled YouTube shorts killed my channel. YouTube shorts are ruining YouTube. Um, and then the debate is my long form views went down because I started doing shorts. Or if I do shorts only, you're creating a split audience or a divided yes. audience. It seems that your experience is busting all of those myths, but what is your reaction to all of that conversation that's happening? Yeah, yes and no. I've been told that shorts should not impact long form views. And I'm also told that someone needs to see, and th I heard this like a year ago, like seven shorts to be recommended one of your long form. Mm. So it's not like someone's gonna scroll across one short, watch it, and then start getting your long form and then not click on it and then af affect your views. I have noticed on my main channel though, long form views did go down when I was posting shorts. Overall subscriber growth went up and overall views went up, but my long form videos were not having the same long tailness when I was posting shorts. But on the iced coffee hour, we ended up getting more views on long form, more views on shorts, more subscribers. So I'm a bit split on it. I think overall it's working and it does a good job. But yeah, on my main channel, I've certainly seen less long form views. So I don't Interesting. know what to say. And your iced coffee hour channel is a video podcast channel that is in a way perfectly aligned clips from the show as well as long form of the show. I would imagine you're using the related video feature where they could watch the yeah. full episode. And it's, you can't use the related video feature on a short to a video that's not on the same channel. No, you can't, so, so it's gotta be uploaded. It's gotta actually channel. be on the channel. But so on Ice Coffee Hour, it's, it would sound like it's perfectly aligned you know, it, to some similar. degree. Whereas I also notice on your main channel, you're using Ice Coffee clips sometimes. Some of them. Yeah. But I link them back to other videos that are relevant on my main channel. Mm -hmm. The conversion on that click through uh, for like related videos is horrible though. Yeah. I mean, it's really bad. So in the beginning when they, when they allowed for like hyperlinks to be placed in a short, we would get about one to 2% conversion, 3% if it like blew, like blew all of our expectations. We would do a pinned comment, say, if you want to watch the full video, click here. That had such higher conversion than that related video. No one clicks on the related mm -hmm. video I found. So it's like under 1% of people. Uh, in most of our cases, it's like under half a percent. So it's well, not really only that bad. you yeah. can actually in analytics see also the watch time correlated to where the traffic came, comes yeah. from, which makes you think when you're in a shorts mindset, you're looking for that quick dopamine hit. So even if you do click through, the question is, would you linger and then watch a three hour episode yeah, as opposed no to starting knowing that I'm going to turn this on and work out and do stuff yeah. and go on a drive and whatever. And I want to just chill and listen to this whole thing. You know, I just thought of this. This would be incredible. If you could hyperlink from that short to the exact timestamp where people left off or clicked, because right now when you click on that little short thing, it takes you to the beginning of the video. But imagine you're on the short, you click to it, and you're at the same spot in the long form video. So you just like watch an extended version. That would be incredible. That's super they don't smart. allow you to do that. Yeah, like, that it goes, then it goes cool. deeper. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you have friends to you, have you had any friends come to you or just people or maybe someone at an event and ever ask you advice for starting a YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, yeah, all the time. And it's usually people who don't have any videos. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's like, oh, yo, I wanna do this, how do I do it? And Okay. Just start. Just start. So when yeah. someone comes to you, what factors lead you to believe they will or won't be successful if you have a conversation with like a friend who is like, oh, Graham, I see what you're doing. I want to start a YouTube channel. I mean, I know you might give them advice of just starting, but if you ask them a few questions, is there any factors you think that goes, man, I think this person has a shot. Or if you go, I think they're just kind of dreaming, but maybe they don't know what it takes. I usually don't like giving advice because it's, I feel like I'm just wasting time. Mm -hmm. And if I spent you know, five minutes giving everyone advice who asks like, oh, I want to start a YouTube channel. I just waste so much time. So I just tell people, post 20 videos and then ask me. Mm. No one posts 20 videos. Yeah. So it's a good filter. Like if someone's willing to spend the time figuring out how to make 20 videos on their own and then comes to me, hey, I did 20 videos. Here's what I found. Like, what do you, then it's different. But if they're just coming at me as like, hey, I want to make a YouTube channel. Give me advice. Make 20 videos. It's like, that's the minimum barrier to entry. And then I'm happy to help. But like until you've done that, there's no, there's no point. 
Yeah, because yeah. Uh, the information could go in one, in one ear but out the other. But the 20 video test is then like, now that's a good entry point to now let's talk. Um, what's the biggest mistake you see new creators make? They don't look objectively at their content and they're like, oh, it's so awesome because I'm the one who did it. And everyone wants to watch me. But when you look at their video, it sucks. And it's like, would you watch your own video? If you were a stranger, why would you care to watch this? You wouldn't. It's a crap video. And they don't look objectively and just think, is this something a stranger, would they care about watching this? No. So don't post it. So you really have to look objectively and think like, what am I offering to somebody else? If you're posting just for the sake of like, because you want to be on camera and you think everyone cares about what you have to say, they don't. People have their own problems. They want to be entertained. They want to learn something. They're coming to YouTube because they want something. And usually that something is really funny entertainment. It's something that they could learn. It's something that they can improve themselves with. If you're not offering anything, there's no reason for people to watch. So you really have to think of what the viewer wants and how you could provide that to them. It's really about the viewer. It's not about you at all. So it's like, what could you give other people? And you have to think of that first. What's the biggest myth people believe about being a successful YouTuber like yourself? The biggest compliment, I would say, is that you just turn on the camera and talk, which makes it seem very easy. Like, oh, you could just flip on the camera and talk for 10 minutes and then post it. There's a lot of work that goes on in the back end. I would say for every main channel video I do, there's at least 12 hours of work. Okay. Like minimum that goes into 12 minutes. So when you think it's like an hour a minute of work when it comes to like planning, filming, editing, title thumbnail. Oh, that's on top of it. So there's probably 15 hours of work per video, uh, minimum. And then for a podcast, sometimes it's days of work. You've been on YouTube seven years? Yeah, seven. It'll be almost seven and a half. Yeah, just over seven years. And your numbers are up and your growth is up and it's still going. Still going. Net, yeah, yeah. net, net. Yeah. Would you say you're working just as hard today as you ever have? No, I, I've, I've, taken the foot off the gas quite a bit in the last year, but that's something I've told myself for the last like five years. I mean, per yeah. video, as opposed to maybe slowing down or do you, do you still, cause has it always been about 15 hours per video? Let's say. Yeah. Sometimes you'll spend a little less. It really depends on what's going on in the week and, and the importance of the video. If, if it's, if it's a video that I don't need to spend as much time on, I won't. Mm -hmm. But if it's a really important video and I know like this is the potential to hit a million views, I need to spend more time on it to give it that extra little polish. I will. But if it's a video where it's sometimes the evergreen, not the ever, sometimes like the news based videos I know are only going to be big for like 48 hours because after that it's going to be irrelevant. So I don't spend as much time on those as I will the videos that I think have such a big audience that it'll, it'll make the difference. So a lot of times success breeds complacency. How do you think you've avoided that to continue to put the work in and maybe not mail it in by being a little bit lazier in the production of your videos? Sometimes I've been lazy for sure. Overall, I love the process. Like in the big picture, I just enjoy making videos and I like selfishly, I like seeing the numbers go up. So for me, I've, I've been a very much like process oriented person where I just, I, I like the process of making videos and keeping on a schedule for me has really been helpful because I don't want to miss that streak. Like I've always posted every week. Uh, and I posted three times a week for six years and I did not miss an upload. If I missed an upload, it was a major holiday or it was because the previous video did so well that I didn't want to throw it off by posting a new video and having the algorithm change. So, you know, keeping up that schedule has been really important because it's just, you don't want to miss that streak. It's like, I've done it for six years. Why would I want to miss this week? Because I don't feel like it. Like I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So that's helped. So break down that 15 hours. What and, and maybe walk us through your day. If you know you're prepping for your next video, I mean, wake up what time? Coffee, uh, computer, articles, paid personal finance or paid economics, like break, break it down bit by bit. Um, yeah, usually the day will start anywhere between like it, it's seven, I would say. And again, my schedule today is a lot different than what it used to be. Like in 2020, it was like a totally different schedule. But now it's probably wake up between seven and eight on average um, and then scour the internet for topics. And that'll usually include reading a lot of Reddit, news. I have this, this one website that'll like aggregate all the news into one, like all the financial news into like one board. And then like every minute there's like a different update because it just aggregates everything that's being posted online. So I like, I look through that. Sometimes I'll have keywords that I type in that'll just give me ideas or prompts like millennials are, are, are pretty popular topic to talk about. So sometimes if it's a new like millennial study, that's easy for me to go into. Real estate's easy for me to go into. 
Um, at this point, I just know what will do well. So do you see, pay for any premium information? Yeah. Uh, Wall Street Journal, Market Watch. Um, I don't know. There's, there's probably about like five different websites that I'll just pay for. But once I find a topic, then I'll think of the spin on the topic, uh, which is usually title thumbnail. I'll loosely think about that. And then I'll go into the scripting phase. And that's usually, you know, on a good day, that'll start around like 10 a.m. And then I'll just, I'm not end the day until I finish scripting. Are you getting up, yeah. working out, or eating breakfast, or are you intermittent fasting and just looking at articles and reading? Yeah, I don't, I don't eat until 12 to 1. I try to, it's like, I, I try to see how long I could go without eating before I just start feeling like crap. And usually that's around 12. And are you a coffee? Well, you have your own coffee. I have a line. coffee in the morning. And you make your own coffee. I do. There'd be no reason you buy a coffee Never. too expensive. No, no, no. It's not. It's not the expense at this point. It's <laughs> just I. I prefer the coffee that I make. Yeah. Than buying it. Like you drink your own coffee, bankroll. I do. Okay, so yeah. you make a cup of bankroll. Yeah. And you're just you're you're lean, focused, and hopefully writing a script by 10 a.m. Yeah. And I found too, like the the whole eating thing really started because I would eat and I just feel like tired afterwards, mm -hmm. and so it really impacted me. If I did anything other than just like focused work in the morning, like even going to the gym and then planning, my mind is like fried already. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. So if I just have a coffee, wake up and then plan, I do better work doing this. So I've just kind of figured out like where I work the best. You script your videos word for word? I do. Yeah, I spend a lot of time on the script. So that's that's where like the bulk of it comes in. Like a good script will be six to eight hours of work. Like okay, a, so- On an easy day. Okay, so best case scenario, six hours- Three, two to three hours of research. Now we're at 10 hours. Yeah. So then what's next? Shooting? Yeah, shooting. Probably a different day. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes I, I'm in that groove and that momentum where I think, you know, if it's, let's just say 8 p.m., I'm like, oh, I could film this in two hours, be done by 10. And then I'm two hours ahead for the next day. And some, so, sometimes I'll just do that. Sometimes I'm just exhausted. So it just depends. But yeah, about two hours of filming, best case an hour. Worst case, probably two and a half. Just it depends on the day, the length of the video, and if I could talk that day. You have two studios, California and Vegas. I have Vegas, uh, California. Just don't use, but I still have it. Yeah, but I don't use it. Okay, so you have Vegas, and, and your videos are known for having two angles: car behind you oh, angle. Oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And so, do you hit record on your own cameras? Do you have two cameras? No, I have one camera. I just move it each time. So you move it one angle, move it to the other angle, and deliver. Your script. Yeah. So I film all the desks. So like in the script, it'll say like desk, chair, desk, chair. So I could film all the desk at the desk and then just move the camera to the car and film that angle. The biggest virtual event for content creators is happening May 23rd through the 25th with Gary Vaynerchuk, Dave Ramsey, Patrick Bet David, Ali Abdal, Cody Sanchez, Shalene Johnson, Pat Flynn, and so much more. This is your chance to get access to top video experts, to network in our exclusive app and connect with creators and entrepreneurs around the world that are using video, and to leave this three-day virtual event with a step-by-step -step plan for how to grow your personal brand, your business, and ultimately monetize your content in new and multiple ways, all happening at Grow With Video Summit. You could go to growwithvideolive.com or just hit the link in the description to secure your ticket before prices go up. What are some of the things you're thinking there about retention? Is there things you're writing into your script and the fact you're switching up desk chair, desk chair for retention? Uh, yeah. It is. And that's also the reason why like on videos, it helps to move your hands. It's like more movement on screen helps people watch longer, even though it looks okay. ridiculous. But yeah, if you're just like this the entire time, <laughs> yeah. it looks so boring. So you have to have movement on screen. Yes. And I don't want like stupid gimmicky pop ups like all the time. So uh, it does help with retention. And for the script, I try to lead everything almost like a story where like at the end of the desk scene, I want to prompt a question or a reason why they should watch the car scene. So like you know, the real estate market's going up, but what does that mean for the next year? Then Switch. it'll go to the car. All right, well, here's the research that I found on this. But what does that mean for you? Desk. Go on that. Well, here's my advice if you're a buyer. And then I, you know, and so you, you always have to hook something as a reason for people to keep watching. And I try to tell like a story. Yeah, so you're not just hooking at the beginning. You're thinking about hooking continuously. You have to. You have to give people a reason to keep watching. Um, otherwise, they're just like, they're not going to watch. If you don't film after grinding all day, when do you typically shut it down? 
seven to eight usually. S- sometimes as early as five, but usually I'd say it's like seven. But you're to eight. sometimes going seven to seven. You're going twelve hour work day. It's not like a continuous twelve hours around like sitting down and uh-huh. little breaks in between. But at home, work from home, yeah. Twelve hours. What are what are your breaks? A little, a little more bankroll coffee and walk outside in the Vegas sun. No, I mean sometimes I'll go to the gym, but usually when I'm planning, I don't want to stop planning. Yeah. So it just it just really depends on the on the day and how I'm feeling. Sometimes I'll go to the gym. Um, sometimes I'll tinker with the aquarium. Sometimes I'll just relax and have lunch. Have you found that it's hard to turn it off? Your brain brain keeps going. Used to. Now my brain doesn't go as much as it used to. But um, but yeah, in the, in the past, it's been a lot worse. When you were doing three a week, this was the grind that was going into all three of those. Yeah, yeah, that was the toughest part because I couldn't afford to have anything distract me, like nothing. So it was all I thought about. It was all I could do. Like even taking time in the middle of the day to do this, like would have been impossible. I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. And if I did, I wouldn't be present. I would be thinking in my mind, how long is this going to end? Uh, I need to go by this time. If I go over, I'm going to have less sleep. And how could I make up the time else? It was it was horrible. Wow. Yeah. But I was well, used to it. So it just felt normal. But like I was not in a good headspace looking back. And I know we have audio listeners, but if you're on YouTube, smash like and share your biggest aha moment because we do appreciate it. This yeah. is a master class already and uh, grateful for you breaking all of this down. So then maybe the next day starts if you're filming that day and you get up at seven again, more bankroll coffee, film one or two hours are you still editing? Now I am. Um, so I was editing up until 2022 or th- I think 2022, maybe early 2023. I forget. No, 2022. Uh, and that's when Alex came in. And when I was doing three videos a week, Alex came in. In the beginning, I would edit my video and Alex would edit the same video. And then we would compare afterwards and we'd like take notes. We did that for like eight months and we kind of honed it in. Alex got really good at that. And then Alex took over completely editing those three videos a week. Then when I went down to one video a week, I took over the editing again. Because it really just, I enjoyed the editing process, but doing three was like just too much for me. What software? Uh, (laughs) iMovie. Alex would edit on Final Cut. Um, I would edit on iMovie. And so do you pull all your screenshots and stuff? You're known for like... um and as a thank you for hitting the like button, here is a picture of a cute squirrel. Yeah. You pull all your own squirrels? I do. Um, I Google cute squirrel or baby squirrel. Baby squirrel. It seems to do the best, yeah, for and retention. So you put in that stuff. If you screen, how do you screen capture if you show charts, market stuff? I mean, are you just pulling still images mostly, zooming in yeah. and doing all that stuff Usually yourself? it's a still image with the Ken Burns. Lately now I have, so I'll edit the video and then I'll send it to another editor and he'll put just final touches like you see now what I have is like the video it'll be a screenshot but you'll see like moving highlighted text so now I'll edit my own video but send it to him and he'll just throw a few like you know rizzes on it and make it look a little nicer a little riz yeah is that just a a Gen Z bomb drop right there riz yeah it's like to spice it up a little bit riz is probably the secret to get it a little extra retention Got to keep I think it helps. I think it just makes it look a little better. Little Riz yeah. keeps people engaged. Okay, so then it's edited, it's exported, it's uploaded. You knew what the title was before you started sometimes, filming. Sometimes I'll come up with a rough title and then I'll upload it. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll come up with different titles on notes on my computer. And then I'll read, I'll like separate them out. So like I'll write them all out like space, 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 space. And then I'll put spaces in between them so I have to keep scrolling and then I'll just in my mind think what am I most likely to click on and then I go through like maybe 10 titles and I'll whittle them down to like the top three and I think of more titles and I just keep honing it to just think if I saw this pop up on my phone would I watch it and if the answer is no I'll just keep trying to think of new titles and then I'll put the title in the video with different thumbnails and then I'll send the video to myself so it shows like the preview of like the thumbnail and the title and I see them together and I'll think, is, does this make sense? Would people want to click on it? Is it eye-catching? And if the answer is no, then I'll keep changing that so that the title works with the thumbnail. That's cool. You know, there's a website called thumbsup.tv, which is just a basic free front-facing website that allows you to upload the thumbnail and the title so you can see it big, small, whatever, and oh, it just kind of populates it. I but I mean, it's exact, it's yeah. kind of the logic. So people should be implementing what you're saying, but then it, it kind of getting a feel, would you click on this? Did YouTube give you 
split testing titles yet on your channel? I wish. I got the split tested thumbnails. Thumbnails, is, that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah, no, so you, I have thumbnails. You have thumbnails. Yeah. So who does your thumbnails? I do. What software? Photoshop. So you do your own thumbnails, your own Photoshop, and are you now doing three? Yes. On every video you throw up, and then it's just deciding for you. Right. And then sometimes it's undecided, like the thumbnails will be really close. Uh -huh. And then I'll pick from those, like which one has slightly better performance. So do you love that feature? The, not everybody has it yet. I would say yes, I do. The downside is that sometimes I think a thumbnail will like, out of the three, there's one. Usually that I'm like, this is better than the other two. And what I don't like is that in the beginning, because it's like swapping the thumbnails depending on who's watching, Sometimes you see performance dip. Like because you know that's the stronger up. one, but yeah. it's harming it because the weaker one, but you're just letting it The weaker decide. one's testing. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes you'll see a dip and then it goes back up and I'm like, oh, it tested that thumbnail. It didn't work. But it's weird because it tests for watch time and not click through. So you could have a really high click through with a certain thumbnail, but lower watch time than someone else who clicks with a different lower performing thumbnail. So I wish they showed you like click through rate instead of just watch time. But my guess is they want people to stick on the platform for as long as possible, so watch time is like their preferred metric. That's fascinating. What, um, so now you're in that final stage, you've uploaded the video, brainstormed 10 or more titles, narrowed it down to three. Now you're doing three thumbnails, mm -hmm. and then you, you let the video you know publish. How often do you pivot? And do you recommend creators, do you think the greats are pivoting if they feel it, and how do you know? Is it a sixth sense? Is it a seven years experience, numbers your size that just goes, oh, I, maybe I should pivot the title, maybe I should pivot the thumbnail? Yeah, I know in the first 10 minutes how it's performing, and sometimes it'll be a slow 10 minutes and it, it'll take to the 30 minute mark to like just catch up. So sometimes that'll happen, sometimes notifications don't go out for the first like five minutes. And that really screws up the numbers because it's like the video posted, views are trickling in, but no notification yet. So I'll usually know 15, 20 minutes in is when I'll start to make changes. And I make changes probably 70% of the time. So and seven just, out of 10 videos you upload, once it hits, what kind of changes do you make? Usually it's a tight, in the first 30 minutes, it's almost exclusively a title problem because those are people that see the notification that click through or are just quickly browsing and click mostly based on title. And then after 30 minutes, it's title thumbnail or thumbnail. So first 30 minutes, it's almost title. So I could just mess with the title a little bit. And then after that, if the title's still not working, then I look at the thumbnail. And if I'm like, this thumbnail is awesome. It's not the thumbnail, it's a title. Sometimes then I'm like, maybe I just screwed up on the topic. Maybe just this topic is more niche than I expected. And I kind of got this off and I thought it would be a bigger audience and it's not. That's my fault. And then sometimes I'll also look at the video and I'll say, well, maybe my intro just wasn't good. Or maybe I lost people a minute in because I went too much on the background and not like going straight into it. So there's usually a reason every video doesn't perform and you got to figure out the reason. Sometimes it's just wrong topic. What are your thoughts on going too extreme? Do you think that sometimes you go too extreme because you don't know what you don't know as far as pivoting? And I heard Todd, Todd Bupri, uh, YouTube um, algorithm, mm -hmm. right, kind of employee talking about sometimes people underestimate the long tail of a video, yeah. the multi-weeks of a video. And I know certain topics you cover are very news-based, but certain are also more evergreen. So do you think it could be in sometimes sideways energy to spend too much time tinkering as opposed to like on to the next? Yeah. How do you know when to let it go? I know which videos are long tail videos. And like I purposely go in thinking this will be an evergreen video. It's not gonna do well out of the gate. And I'm expecting after a few months it'll do well. But some, the news-based ones, there should be at worst a six out of 10, like at worst. Yeah. So if they're not, then gotcha. that, that's on me. Got you. So if it's news-based, if it's trend, if it's now information, if it should be getting interest right now, that's what you're thinking about tweaking so that it hits hardest right now. Yeah. If you go like, into yeah. Evergreen, you're like, this is great because I'm going to let this thing kind of rank exactly. and search or rank and suggest it and just kind of hang out. And uh, knowing that distinction is, is powerful. So- You've posted the video, it's public. Do you on your main channel uh, have a, an exact upload time or after the day or two of hustle that's gone into it, do you publish it as soon as it's ready? Rarely will I publish as soon as it's ready. There's certain topics where I know if I waited a day, 
it could be irrelevant. So like I'll post that as soon as possible, but usually I try to maintain every Wednesday at 1 p.m. So you're reverse engineering back from that. So do you try to take weekends off and get to work on Monday so that you're getting ready for Wednesday? It depends. It just depends on how I feel. Yeah. I have I've more of a work when I feel type of space now. And sometimes if I know I'm going to be out of town or I'm traveling for the podcast, I'll get it done ahead of time. Or sometimes I'll get it done on the weekend because I know I'm going to be gone on Monday be because of a podcast. So I just try to work around that. What is your feelings around the controversial debate around hustle culture and maybe that season that sounded so intense and you look back and you go, it was intense three a week, but also there's a great argument for any success requires sacrifice and sacrifice for a season is one thing as opposed to burnout hustle culture just in, until you grind into powder and nothing in a puddle of unhappiness so what do you think the tension is where some people you know everyone's got opinions and that's not really what it's about but what for you what is maybe you've learned in the wisdom of the years of the tension between balance and a sustainable pace versus seasons of sprinting and sacrifice that takes a toll yeah i think you know i would say if you asked me that like six years ago i'd say that like hey you have to sacrifice you have to hustle if you're not doing that you're lazy this is something you have to do like if you want above mediocrity you got to put in the work now i'm i've realized that not everyone wants that and i think I, I didn't realize that i'm unique in the fact that i love working and if i'm not putting in the, that time i'm just like i feel kind of miserable so i didn't fully understand that not everyone feels that way and so i think it's it's okay for some people that just don't have that um mindset or want that but i think if you, if you have certain goals and you want to achieve them like you cannot be lazy you have to put in the time because if you're not someone else is like there's always someone else who's going to outwork you so you have to compete with that like if, if you're taking weekends off and if you're just you know putting in half days and not giving it all like someone else will so that's the person you're up against so you have to so i look back and i have no regrets but i'm also unique that i just loved working you're engaged yeah do you have a wedding date? Uh, yeah. It'll be coming up this year, this summer. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Do you think things shifted once you decided to shift into maybe engaged mode? No. You're still no, the no, same. No. Yeah, yeah. The engage, the, her and the engagement have nothing to do with the workload. I mean, I have thought since 2019, I'm like, all right, now I'm going to scale back a little bit. Like, I've been saying this every year for a long time. So this has been coming, and I knew going into YouTube that I can't do this forever. And so I've always just wanted to do it for as long as I can and then start to scale back. And so far, I've just maintained that. I don't know. Uh, realistically, I could do the podcast for another 10 years. I mean, that's something that's that's low lift. You know, I, I don't have to burn myself out on that. The main channel was something that I knew that, like, hey, you're in a really unique position now. If you can post three videos a week, I'm not going to be able to do it forever. So I may as well just keep the ball rolling. So I continued three videos a week until... I was like, all right, I'm going to try to, and I tried to, and like nothing bad happened. And then I went to one and I realized like, wait, the views are the same. Like I thought the channel would just die. Mm. So <laughs> I've been able to maintain for the most part with one video a week and still grow the channel. So what phase did, speaking of the podcast, also speaking of the Graham Stephan show, which can pull incredible views and in, that's lower lift as well. More reaction. Yeah. Do you let somebody else edit that? I do. So when did these converge? Were you at, when you were doing three a week, did you also have the podcast? Yeah. yeah so at the, at the peak, it was like 11 videos a week. <laughs> and I did that. I did 11 videos a week, I think for a year and a half or two years. Okay. Maybe uh, it was almost two years, 11 videos a week. And do you look back and say, that was fun, but I don't know if fun's the right word. That was, that was maybe a too much. Um, I didn't realize it was too much until looking back. Um, but at the time, I mean, it just made sense because I had the capacity to do it. You were crushing. Yeah. And when you get used to that, it's just, it seems normal. So when you're in it, like, and also, it's just, there's, yeah. So, but also, unmarried, no kids. Correct. So even season of life. And that was your self awareness. You love working and you were seizing the opportunity that you had. I would say so. Yeah. You were just going, you're like, I mean, let me steward this yeah. well. Like, this is a blessing. Yeah. The funny thing is, I actually got burnt out most by doing the vlog channel. Okay. That was, that was the, and, and that was the one that made like no money. Yeah. It was the one that had the least lift, but it was the one that burned me out the most. That was, that was horrible. That's what like kind of pivoted a lot of stuff for me is just like, that was, if I could go back and just not do the vlog channel, that would have, I would have probably had more longevity.
because it was so much to be able to like film three main channel videos a week, three second channel videos a week, and then three vlogs a week. And then like when you're not filming or like working, then you're filming everything else. And like that took its toll. That was the worst of it. Have you, I'm sure you and Macy have had conversations about what the next 10 years could look like. You think this pace will continue? Yeah, probably. Um, but you know, I don't know how much longer I'll post on the main channel for, um, maybe another year, maybe five years for it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, could be at a point where I just post if there's something I want to talk about, which I think is like every person's dream is just like, Hey, I have something to say, I'll post about it. I'm not going to care. Uh, I'm still on the point where I like, I still care about like video performance, how it does and how the channel does. Uh, but maybe at some point in the future, I could just not care and just post Hey, there's this going on in the market today. I'll talk about it. So that could happen at any point. So you're still, you're, you have delegated editing. You're now back on editing yourself, but the Graham Stephan show channel, which would be probably the smallest of the three is somebody else editing. What, how many people to run the ops of what you do now? Not much really for me in the second channel. It's me. And uh, our editor, Arby, edits the second channel videos and he puts the spazazz on like the main channel, like those cool little like text stuff that you see on the screen. Uh, that's really it. And then on the podcast, it's me and Jack. We have an editor um, and then Josh who does our clips. And is Jack, do, I mean, he also has his own channel. He, has, I, he I th- hasn't posted on it. Okay. Yeah, he, I, I would call it his. I mean, he does have a channel, but I don't think he's posted on there in like. Two so years. then, how do you are are you is is his main focus what you guys do together? Yes, so kind of like partners. We are. And so, and you kind of have him maybe doing more of the heavy lift and research and whatnot, and you sit he with. He does a really great job on research with guests. Like he'll spend the entire week researching a guest and listening to like all their podcasts. I don't have the time to be able to do that. Totally. So he comes in like really prepared with the guests, and then he has a good eye for the podcast. So he'll review that podcast like three times over and, you know, rearrange certain segments. He'll delete certain clips where it's just like not good and we'll lose interest. So he like he really hones in on the the algorithm retention aspect of the podcast. Interesting. So just because the conversation's all recorded, if there is like a weak spot, then then polish could be a pod. I mean, that might oh, be always. removed. Every every podcast. It's it's rare we'll include something in its entirety. Like if we film three hours, we'll probably include two. Just because there's there's gonna be an hour in there or just like nonsense where maybe we go <laughs> off into um just the spin-off that has nothing to do with the conversation. Sure. And it's just it's pointless to leave that in. And we're not going to put that mm. in there. So is there a through line too? Like, was that not only, that is a chance where somebody would b- bounce. Yeah. And uh, we want to keep it good. We want to, you know, if we post three hours, we want all three hours to be like the best content of what we filmed. Do you study anybody else like Diary of a CEO? I listen to him. I don't, I don't study anybody. Like, did but you I'll hear to it. Yeah. They, they split test a hundred thumbnails per episode. That's insane. Three different faces of the guest with like 25 phrases because they use quotes from the show. And I think they do paid ads on Google somewhere just to figure it out and then to really dial it in. And they, uh, yeah, the nuance of the, of course, the hooks and other things that they're doing. So is there anybody else? who, Who do you in the YouTube game, maybe old or new, respect, look up to, or you've learned from, and maybe like the unique things you've pulled tips from them or insights of the way they do things. Yeah. Lewis Howes, I think is fantastic in his longevity, his guests, the way he asks questions, the way he structures. Um, Love him. Lex Friedman is also fantastic. He has really thoughtful questions. Like I like how his are very philosophical. Uh, Joe Rogan, I'll listen to. Um, there's plenty of, I mean, really, I'll just listen to anything I can get my hands on. I like the Nelk podcast because it's super laid back uh, and it's different. Same with the uh, Steve-O's Wild Ride. I like it's more fun. So everyone has their own spin on things. Who, you have brand deals on every channel. Who's your brand yeah. deal coordinator? Many. I mean, we work with like seven to 10 different companies. It's whoever will bring us a deal. So we don't have. So it's more agencies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then do you have like an admin assistant somebody helping to dj all that or you just do that depends on the channel sometimes i'll do it myself sometimes we have someone who will be assisting so if they bring a deal it's the fact that it would be these different brand deal agencies and then you assess the deal that way as opposed to like going out or there's no one dedicated 
Right. It's agencies that do it. Correct. Yeah. And maybe we should be doing a lot of this work ourselves. I'm not sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, How did you pull off and when did you pull off the coffee in the midst of everything to handle that on top of everything else you're doing? Yeah. Well, someone else is doing the coffee. So yeah. I have, so I'm really just the the face of it, but I have someone else doing all the back end. So I, I touch nothing mm-hmm. in terms of like manufacturing or shipping. Uh, but he runs several different creator brands. He's fantastic. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's a low lift on my end to be able to do that. Okay. So then for someone listening to this too, when they look ahead at somebody with your success and your momentum, you know, I, we're getting very tactical in terms of like your schedule, maybe your life, how you balance stuff. You know, you also, you did real estate up until 2020, mm-hmm. but you still have some properties. Yeah. Do you have, uh, how do you, how do, on top of it all? Cause I mean, your schedule is a little bit different, um, a little bit lighter now. It's not the three a week, but you also got some properties to manage. I think like, just go back to young Graham. What are your tips for scaling up in entrepreneurship? People are like, Hey, you know, invest in real estate, build a side hustle, launch your thing, do this. But it, all of these things also are a different weight. Is it some team? Is it your personal systems and habits? Is it, and so I'm just trying to add in, I mean, on top of everything we've already talked about, somebody could be like, my gosh, I'm exhausted just listening to you. But then you also have some, you know, real estate to manage. Did that just become a muscle? So it's much much more passive. It did. I mean, I've always focused on like where, like my time is probably best spent, but that's also meant that a lot of things have fallen to the wayside. Like I'm not as good as I should be when it comes to optimizing the real estate because an hour spent there figuring out like what remodels I could do and how to raise rents on like this unit that's now vacant could be better spent on a YouTube video that'll make like five times that amount. So it's a, I've I've taken a very easy approach to the real estate where I could have done a lot better, but I've always focused like right now today, where's my time best spent? I'm going to spend my time on that. And then everything else I'm not going to think as much about, but the real estate for me, like I haven't bought real estate since 2020. So like everything is already there. I've not had the time to go and find anything else because it's better spent just like asking better questions to a guest on a podcast. It's probably a higher ROI than me going and looking at real estate. So I focused on that. So, you know, I probably could optimize that. And that's probably a weak point to mine. Do you think, what what is your thoughts on comparison, meaning this, and in your, some of your peers, friends, all have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think, Sometimes we look at what somebody else is doing. They might have a natural gifting for it. Like, so what would you say between you and meet Kevin? Like maybe the level of volume he's doing and say real estate also his content strategy is more of a volume play. But what have you learned maybe? And then say Andre or fill in the blank, anybody else. Do you think that uh, in social media, they talk a lot about how comparison can be, it's so common, but sometimes maybe it's like, we got to stay in our lane. We got to stay in our gifting. What are your thoughts on that? I think everyone's different. I like comparison because it makes you think bigger. Mm -hmm. I like looking up and being like, oh, well, that's possible. I could work towards that. Of course, it's always good to like look around you and and appreciate what you have. But I think at the same time, like just we as people just want to continue growing and improving ourselves. So whether that be you at the gym and like you could be buff and you look at the other guys like, oh, I want that. I think I think it's good. I think it's just a part of improving yourself continuously. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think you want to get to a point where like, all right, I'm 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 set, I'm good, I'm done. Because then I feel like when you when you do that, you tend to like slide back. Um, so I think comparing yourself is, is good in that aspect if you don't look at it with like envy and jealousy. If you look at it as like inspiration, I think it's great. But also everyone's different. Like, you know, if I look at Ron and Coleman, like I'm not going to have the physique that he, that, that he has. So I think so, some things are unrealistic, just like I could look to another YouTube channel and see what they're doing. And I'm thinking, well, that that's not me. So I don't have that same, you know, personality or drive to do that, but I can do this over here. Do you think the majority of people have settled for mediocrity? Uh, probably, I would say. Uh, I would say some people just, did have different goals. That's totally acceptable. But I think a lot, I don't know what percentage of people have huge dreams and just don't pursue them. It's probably out of fear. Yeah. Um, it's probably out of the fear of failure is, is a big one or failing. And, and you know, what would your, what would your peers think of you? Or what would your family think? And would people talk negatively? It's, um, or it's, you know, there could be financial barriers to that too. Of just like, Hey, you want to start your own business, but you're like, 
you know, minimum wage working 12 hours a day. Like how, how so I think you know, there are some things that people could overcome, but I think each of the circumstances will be different. Yeah, not everybody has to dream big, but a lot of people are certainly capable of more than they've settled for. Yeah, yeah. People just settle for something and they're like, oh, this is the best I could get, so I may as well just stay here. Uh, certainly, I think it's comfortable, but I don't know. Is it fulfilling? Maybe for some people. So I think it really just depends on the person. How much does it cost to be you? A lot of the expenses are really discretionary if just depending on how much I want to invest in a video or what I want to do with that. I mean, day-to-day -day yeah. expenses. Did you, you've reviewed some people's like millennial money, yeah, like Shelby churches or somebody like that, right? Yeah. Did you ever have one done about you? I did. And what were the numbers roughly? Like your monthly <laughs> I expenses? Don't even remember. I don't even remember. I mean, is it on um, Chipotle? I mean, you go to like really nice dinners? Not really. I would say like the biggest dinner expense is usually like me going out with like other YouTube buddies uh, and just like, you know, sometimes I'll pick up the tab, sometimes not, sometimes I'll just pay for mine. I would say probably that's the most extravagant when it comes to that. Or like usually podcast guests, for instance, if they come in, if we go to dinner afterwards, like yeah. we'll absolutely pick up the tab on that. Sometimes we'll pay um, for like other little things that we do with, with guests. You know, I think that's just a, a nice thing to do, but do you have any personal, like you collect cards or anything? You ever bought like a Pokemon card? You any of that it's stuff? It's been a long time since I bought Pokemon cards, it, but that's like a few hundred bucks. I mean, that's, there's, there's no hobby that I have that is like really expensive. I would say, uh, the aquarium is probably the most expensive thing that I do. Is but there even a really like, expensive fish in there? The most expensive is like 300 bucks, mm -hmm. but that's like the most expensive like a lot of the stuff you get like very cheap on Facebook Marketplace. How expensive can <clears throat> fish get? Thousands, just depending on the type of fish you want. But I would say most of, pretty much any fish that you want is going to be under a grand. And that's like including a really high end ones. Do you have a like, dream fish? Um, Like a rare fish. Uh, I mean, there's a peppermint angel fish. You throw a picture of that. It's like a little, uh, like kind of reddish orange with white stripes. It's super cool. But there's like 15 grand. Like I wouldn't spend. You wouldn't. No. Oh, gosh, no, that's a what, car. What if you treat yourself uh, someday when you hit a certain number and you get the I peppermint would, fish? I would rather a, a, a watch. Oh, you like watches? I like watches, too. But, like, between a peppermint fish that, you know, there's no guarantee on that fish. They go in your tank, get bullied, and die. Or it could just, <laughs> you know, something, it just stops eating one. Like, you don't want to do that. That would be, yeah. that's risky. Yeah, that's why I would never spend, I would never spend more than, like, a few hundred dollars on a fish. Oh, at man. The most. Because it might get bullied and might just die you or stop know. eating. It's like you're, you're, you're taking fish and putting them in an aquarium where there's so many variables that could go wrong. You know, yeah. the temperature goes up too much. Like there's so many things. Or sometimes the fish just very sensitive. Fish. Has Macy I mean, ever to... sabotaged your fish? No. How would you sabotage Well, I don't know fish? if you left her in charge of the temperature or something and she killed your peppermint fish. No, no, no. Everything, is, re everything is regulated. So that uh -huh. means like that would never be on her. That would be on like a fault with the aquarium Usually something that's on me. Okay. And or an act of God would have to be it. But usually like I have alerts on my phone. So if something oh, goes off in the aquarium, that's a, like, that's a fancy it. aquarium. So you have an app that keeps you yeah. in the know. Man, that yeah. talk about stress. Like if a friend or a family member had to like look over your fish oh, they and do. then whoops, you know. They and, do, they do. And but then, it's but it's all automated. Like I could yeah. go a week and have the tank be fine. Two weeks gets iffy. Um, but I can go a week without it. Like every, everything is automated. Like if the alkalinity gets too high, I get a notification on my phone and I could just turn down the dosing on that. Like it's very simple. What is your most expensive possession, not counting cars or houses? Probably a Zenith El Primero. It's the original Zenith El Primero from 1969. I don't know what that is. It's just a watch. Oh, okay. Um, but it belonged to my grandpa. Wow. And so, yeah, so it was a cool story on that, but he... It's a cool story. He passed away. No, uh, he he did pass away, but um, they were clearing out all of his possessions, and I just happened to go by the house just because I was in the area, and I just I knew my mom was there and my aunt, and they were cleaning out the house, and I just happened to go by to say hi, and I go there and they had the, the big like trash bin out front, and under the trash bin because the trash bin was full. There was like a little box in there. And for some reason, I was like, hmm, I wonder what's in the box. And I kind of go through it. And in there is a little watch case. It's like a little tiny black case. And I opened it up and there was this watch in there. And I had no, like Zenith, I thought like 
growing up in the 90s that this is like the TV radio company, like Zenith. So I was like, oh, I didn't know Zenith made watches. That, that's cool. It didn't work. And um, I just thought it was a cool looking watch. I had no idea what it was. So I asked my mom, like, hey, do you know like the stuff by the trash? She's like, oh, we're throwing that all away. I'm like, this, this watch is in there. You mind if I, can I take it? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. Because it was going to get thrown away. And so I took it into a place to get serviced. And they're like, wow, this is one of the best conditions NFL Primeros we've ever seen. Like, it doesn't look like it's ever been worn. It looks like it's just been in this box for like 50 years, 40 years. So I got it serviced and I wore that watch like every single day. And just since then, vintage watches have gone up in value just because it's become trendy. But this turned out to be like the original chronograph in 1969. And I believe my grandpa worked as a salesperson for Zenith in the early 1970s. And when he left, they gave him this watch as a gift. And at the time, these Zenith watches were like worth nothing. Um, but they were like the TV company Zenith bought the watch brand because they shared the same name and then eventually sold the watch brand right afterwards. So like this weird period of time where like the Zenith TVs were connected to the watch. Hmm. And so that's when he got it. But I, I wore it. How much is it worth? 20 something grand. Wow. Yeah. What a cool story. And it yeah. was, it was about to be thrown away. Yeah. $20,000 watch. Well, at the time it was not worth 20 grand. So it, like today it is. Yeah. But back then it was not worth anywhere close to that. It was just. You know, vintage watch, watch collecting has gotten very trendy. Vintage watches have been at the top of that. So it was just like timing on that. No pun intended. Timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, a few other questions um, as we kind of dive back. Video podcasting. We, we touched on Ice Coffee Hour before. Do you think video podcasting is too saturated though in that can people still start new shows this year? They can, but it's getting saturated. But then again, I said that in 2016 when I started making YouTube videos. I thought it was saturated too. And look at where we're at now. And new creators so, are popping up all the time. Yeah. So I would say video, everyone's doing a podcast, which yeah. is, is is a thing where I'm like, uh, like, how much time do we have left before everybody has a podcast? And how many but, three hour shows are even humanly possible exactly. listening to? Everyone's doing one. Every creator who's like made YouTube videos is now like, I'm going to do a podcast, which is smart because they're pivoting into something that's working right now. It's getting saturated. I don't know if it's too saturated, but you have to really put a spin on things. Yeah. The, the hardest aspect of a podcast is getting a good guest because a podcast is really only as good as like the questions you ask, your personality and the guest. And it seems like guests are kind of like, pimping themselves out to like everybody. Like if you have one guest, they're making the rounds on like five different podcasts and it's like, who gets them first? And then it's like, they're competing with like all these other podcasts. It's like certain creators would be best off just going on like one or two and stopping and not doing more than that. Mm. So it's, it's tough to get interesting guests that have not been on like a bajillion other podcasts and you want to make it different than that. And usually people don't have a different story. So it's like, how could you make it different? It's really tough. How have you gotten some of these big guests? You've had Mr. Ballin, that's like your most viewed video yeah. on the ice. And you have Dave Ramsey, Ben Shapiro, many others. Uh, I mean, one, you also came in with a lot of influence in the yeah, momentum of the helped. podcast. But that, that helped tremendously because in the beginning, I think when I started the podcast, the, the main channel is like a 2 million something subscribers. Yeah. So it really was super easy to say, hey, my main channel is at 2 million subscribers, just started a podcast, do you want to come on? A lot of people just said yes, especially because we were, we were more so in like the personal finance business space. Everyone said yes. So that kind of helped get us off the ground. And then from there, as the main channel grew, a lot of that was just like me DMing people. Um, now we have someone who helps us book guests. Um, so we we do have a booker who will help with some of those, like Ronnie Coleman was one of them. Um, uh, but Ben Shapiro was like, we would never have been able to get him on, but we had Brett Cooper on and we had watched her on YouTube and it was easy to send a DM like, Hey, I've got a channel with like three and a half million subscribers would love to have you on the podcast. And she, I think at the time was under a million. And so hers did so unbelievably well that like Ben felt comfortable afterwards and like mm -hmm. did a great job with her. Uh, I trust that you'll do a great job with me too. So gotcha. that really helped like get our foot in the door. Momentum starting, being excellent with each episode, compounding that momentum. What advice now though, if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody not in your circumstances to maybe try to punch above their weight class in terms of guests, or you said you got to figure out an angle if you were 
coaching a friend that wants to cut through the noise in a 2024 world to start a show, what what advice would you give them? Pick a really interesting guest that people wouldn't think of. Like I think uh, Soft White Underbelly did a really good job sharing stories of people from all walks of life that you would never expect to see in an interview. And he's talking about a lot of taboo subjects. And that is like, people have a curiosity. Uh, there's someone collecting like, uh, like death memorabilia. It's like, what? You would never even expect that. But I listen, it was a very odd, but like interesting interview that is just like, who would do that? So he came up with a really weird angle and some of his stories are just fantastic. And, and there's been a lot of people who have been discovered from his podcast that they just have a really cool story that has never been shared before. Theo Vaughn uh, had someone on who was a garbage man. Just interesting. So I think you could have people on if they're good in the camera, they're charismatic, they have a big personality, just sharing an interesting story. Mm. So you could have just people from all walks of life. Like what it's like to own a convenience store. I don't know. You, Pick people who just are good on camera. I'd say it's more important because like, you could have a garbage man who's just quiet, terrible on camera. But Theo picked a guy who was like, very charismatic, very funny, very outgoing, and it showed on camera. If you have not seen our free masterclass yet, you're going to love it. If you're serious about growing your YouTube channel, just go to thinkmasterclass.com for a one-hour deep dive on-demand YouTube strategy class. On your podcast, you seem to have a variety of guests, mm -hmm. but you also seem to have guests from both sides. Yeah. The both sides of the political mm -hmm. spectrum in particular and guests that are maybe known to debate or have conflicting ideologies. Are you intentionally, what kind of brand are you thinking about building or is there a reason why, what is your approach? Why do that? What is your philosophy yeah. there? I don't want to be known as someone who has like, I hate this. It really bugs me when people are like, oh, he's just having all these like, alt-right people on his channel. I hate it. Like, I am so in the middle on so many things, and I'm truly indifferent on so many things. But when you have someone on the right, people just, th that's all they want to see for some reason. It's, oh, they had they have this person on. They must support this. And so for me, it's, it's so equally important to have both sides on. And so we have just as many people on the left. I mean, we really try to make it one-to-one. -one. If we have someone in the middle, we'll balance with, you know, right and then we'll balance with equally left and if someone's really on the right we'll balance with someone really on the left like i think we had like ben shapiro and destiny mm -hmm. like shortly after each other and you know i, I don't like it when people are just like oh just because they don't see all the the people on the left so we really try to make a very balanced dynamic to represent all sides and i want people to be able to watch this and just hear something that's unbiased because we go into it like there's so many things i just don't care i don't care uh, and there's things on the right that I pull from, things on the left I pull from. So it's, I, I really try to go into it, like very neutral. You want to have a so conversation. Debate is healthy. Unfortunately, there's so much polarization. Yeah, I'm not there to debate. I want to hear a perspective and I just want to hear why you believe that, what led you to believe that, and how could this help people and why do you think that's the right thing to believe? That That's it. Yeah. So if it's, you know, you believe the sky is red. Why? I'm just curious. I just like, I don't care. You believe you could believe this guy is red. I, it doesn't bother me, but why? Yeah. I think that's interesting. We have a rare opportunity to hear from you because you spend hours researching and studying the economy, studying wages, studying the job market, studying the plight of millennials. Can they afford a house? Can they, how's their career going? Do you think we're going into a recession in 2024? Everything seems to be pointing a, a no, but- the the studies that have come out now say that we have a 60% chance of recession in 2024. When you look at consumer spending, household wealth, it doesn't seem like that's likely. But then again, they've, they've said, you know, 80% chance of recession this year. And it's like, hey, well, you know what? 60% chance means 40% chance there's not going to be. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Um, I think if you focus on yourself, it really doesn't make much of a difference what's going on with the economy. Do you think it's a good time to buy a house right now? It's tough. So like I've not bought a house since 2020. That was the last year that I bought. Housing values are up since then. But like the last time I bought a house was when I locked in a mortgage rate of 2.8%. So I've been looking for deals. I don't see them. And so it's tough for me because I, I, I believe in my, in my core that now is a bad time to buy a house and I'm not buying and I'm like waiting to find a deal. 
but it's hard for me because like I felt that same conviction in 2010 and 2011 when I'm like, this is a great time to buy a house. I was so sure of it. And I feel that same way now, but it's hard also trying to be objective and like, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, how long should I wait before I admit like, hey, I, I was wrong that like, maybe today's a great time to buy a house. The hard part for me is when I look objectively, when you buy a house, you could rent that same house in 95% of the country for less than it would cost to buy. When you do the math, it takes about 10 years to break even the cost of renting versus the cost of buying when you add in opportunity cost. And I think I, I went in there that, that home prices would appreciate an average of like 2% net because you're also going to have home expenses like repairs and maintenance and stuff like that. So even if it's 3%, you're going to have to factor in maintenance to that. So even say 2% net, you're putting a down payment on that. You're paying 7% interest. A lot of people who own houses, like in my situation, 2.8%, I'm not going to sell that house because you need to get rid of the mortgage. So I'm going to rent it. A lot of rental inventory is coming on the market. Rents are actually coming down. So mm. you have such tremendous opportunity as a tenant to like negotiate a good deal and rent a home for oftentimes half the cost of buying. So I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, why would I ever buy? Like here in Vegas, a $3 million house, that'll probably cost you 18000 a month with 15% down maintenance. You'd be able to rent the same house for eight, seven. You know, let's even do it on a smaller scale, realistically. A seven hundred thousand dollar house costs you five something grand a month. You could rent it right now for twenty eight, twenty nine. So when I'm looking at that and thinking, now you lock yourself into a house. If you sell it, you're gonna pay another six percent. You're responsible for property taxes, insurance, which is going up, repairs, cost of materials is going up. There's so many things, and you've locked yourself in with a down payment, or you rent, and now you have this twenty percent nest egg that you could do something else with. It's tough for me. So like, I'm because I, I put myself in the position of like, if I were going to move, I would rather rent. And so if I'm in that position, it just yeah. seems like the smart thing to do, but I could be wrong. And housing prices could continue to go up because there's such a big shortage of homes. And they're saying that even if builders worked at like full capacity, like doubled their output, it would still take four to five years for the supply to normalize with demand. So maybe housing values keep going more expensive. It's just going to only go so high until eventually buyers are just going to back out yeah. or rents are going to be to a point where it just makes sense to rent. I don't know. I'm just not seeing it right now, though. As we land the plane, um, one of the things that I, I do love about your consistent advice is it seems like it's wise and conservative yeah. that you you kind of come back to like be smart, don't be dumb, which is always good advice, you know, I guess, don't be dumb. You know, like hey, be thoughtful, be thoughtful about your budget. Um what would you creators listen to this, entrepreneurs listen to this, small business owners listen to this, but also a lot of people starting. Like so a lot of people that are they're trying to side hustle W2s, employees that want to start a side hustle. Graham Stefan, what is your kind of like advice. I like that you say, like, would you say opportunity cost? Expand on that. If you buy a house, if there's other liabilities you take on, then that might be something that you can not invest in that next right. dream or that next. So what's kind of a framework for you if about setting goals, keeping expenses low, like what's kind of your thing? If you were coaching someone that wants to build something, mm-hmm. ambition to start something, um, but that, so they don't get in a place where their overhead is too high and they have all this stress and pressure on them that slows down or delays or even stops. Yeah, that part of me dr- thinks if something is working, just keep doing it. If you get the golden goose, don't try to find another one. What do you mean by that? Sometimes I see creators who do like really well and they're like, oh, I want to expand in this now and this mm. and this and this. And they get too scattered and they they don't realize that like what you have right now is perfect. Like mm. this is it. So just keep doing that, like making this thing better instead of trying to branch out and do too much. Do you think um, from your observation that uh, peers or maybe not close peers, but people you observe, let their lifestyle creep get too high when things are going good? Mm. It's tough for me because I don't, I have such a small group of friends that Mm -hmm. like for any of us, I just, I don't see it, (laughs) which is is really weird. Your group Uh, of friends though, isn't that way you're saying? Like their lifestyle creep of- It doesn't exist. There is no lifestyle creep that I see from people around me. Okay. It is the same if they make 10 million or 
10 grand. It's, it's their, their lifestyle is not changing. So I don't really see a lot of lifestyle creep just from people around me, but I'm definitely sure it exists. Got you. Yeah. Um, well, Graham, I'm so grateful for all the wisdom you've shared. And uh, in just a second, I'd love maybe a couple final words for uh, you built so much over the last seven years. And previous to that, also selling Sunset, real estate, all the different stuff you've done. So maybe a few final words in just a second for people that are starting that would love to build something even similar to what you've built in the level of impact and success. But please, of course, we'll link everything up in the show notes, but is there any projects or anything that you have going on that we can link to coffee, anything else? Just link to the iced coffee hour. That would make me happy. You want to hit a million subscribers there. So you're you just, close. Yeah, we're close. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The iced coffee hour podcast. Yeah. And then, yeah. What final thoughts? So you're, you're talking, you're talking to somebody that is uh, early on in their career and they wanna have success as a content creator or as a business owner trying to leverage content, build a personal brand, what are just some final thoughts about the mindset lessons you've learned along the way? For content creation, you have to be consistent. And yet, like I mentioned in the beginning, you have to think of the audience and what they wanna see. So if you're not providing value to them in every single video and every single minute, then they're not gonna watch and it's all gonna be for nothing. So like if, if it's content creation, provide value first. Think of the audience first. Like what, what are you trying to solve for them? And people won't care about you. They'll care about what you could do for them. So think of what you how you could serve other people, I think is always the best way to think about it. It's just what could you do for somebody else? How could you make their life a little better for whatever time that they watch your video? So think of the other person first. Don't never think of yourself. It's always about the other person. So strong. Graham Seven, thank you. Big Media Podcast, like, rate, subscribe, share. And uh, my name is Sean Cannell, your guide to building a profitable YouTube channel. Can't wait to connect with you in a future episode. Peace.